Healthcare disparities and healthcare is a hot topic in our state and in our nation. And here on the forum where your voice counts is our topic of conversation today with Dr. Phil Levy. Welcome to the forum, Dr. Levy. It's my pleasure to be here, Sion. You are the Assistant Vice President of Transitional Science and Clinical Research. Did I say that right? Tra translational. Translational Science and Clinical Research Innovation for Wayne State University School of Medicine, as well as the Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Emergency Medicine. You're also a Fellow at the American College of Emergency Physicians and American Heart Association and the American College of Cardio Cardiology with more than 200 publications to your name. That's definitely a mouthful, and I know you have many other titles um, behind your name. Could you share those with us as well? Uh, sure, I'll share. I'll share one of them, which I Please. think is perhaps most important to the audience. Uh, I'm also the uh, the president of the American Heart Association's Metro Detroit affiliate, and in that role, uh, I work very closely with the American Heart Association staff. Uh, and uh, community liaisons and, and the whole wonderful group that we have uh, here at our offices in Southfield to, to really look at ways that we could um, better the cardiovascular health and outcomes for our community. And, and one of the most important initiatives that we're working on now is blood pressure, hypertension, and trying to mitigate the, the impact of this on, on our region. We have uh, an area that is uh, pretty drastically impacted by high blood pressure uh, with early onset of heart disease, uh, particularly in, in two communities, in, in the black community in Detroit and, and the Arab community uh, in Dearborn. Uh, both of these communities are exposed to high levels of stress, uh, different stresses, but high levels of stress and uh, other factors that, that contribute to this. And, and really, perhaps if, if the audience remembers nothing today, I wanna get the message out there that uh, being mindful of your numbers and knowing what your blood pressure is and what you need to do to reduce it if it's elevated uh, is critically important. Well, usually this kind of thing is non-symptomatic uh, and usually people don't know uh, that they're walking around with high blood pressure, hypertension, until something critical happens. Right. So what are the risk factors and, and what do we look for if we find that we're, we're feeling a little different? And again, it's non-symptomatic. So what do we do to make sure that we, we remain heart healthy? Uh, that's a, if a, that's even a possibility in this environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it is a possibility, but I think it, it, um, it calls attention to detail, that, uh, or calls for attention to detail. That's critical. So. It is known as the silent killer because while your blood pressure is rising, you may not feel anything. Maybe you feel a little dizzy, maybe you have a headache every once in a while, but who doesn't feel dizzy and have right. a headache uh, these days with the constant bombardment of information coming towards us and the demand for immediate responsiveness uh, on all forms of social media. A and so what happens is people will accumulate a rise in blood pressure over time. Vital organs in the body, such as the brain, the kidneys, and the heart will get affected by this rising blood pressure. and Everything is fine until it's not, until you have a stroke, until you have a heart attack, until you develop heart failure, or your kidneys start to uh, de uh, deteriorate and function. And only then do people start to recognize the importance of taking care of it. But I think if you ask everybody who ever suffered from any one of these conditions, if they knew now what they knew then, uh, if they only knew then what they know now, they would, they would certainly- Do things differently. <laughs> yeah, do things differently. Nobody wants to be hooked up to a, dial a dialysis machine. Uh, we've seen a lot of ho high profile strokes as of late in, yes. in, uh, in people across the spectrum of affluence, uh, wealthy people um, who would seem to have all the means in the world to control risk factors suffering from the same uh, consequences as the poorest of the poor. So it, it affects everybody in all walks of life. And the risk factors are, are myriad. There's a, there's a combination of things that play into this. There's genetics, there's the environment, there's the way the environment interacts with your genetics, there's health behaviors, things like smoking cigarettes and high salt diets and exercise and obesity and um, uh, drug use and alcohol consumption and psychosocial factors uh, like uh, potentially challenging uh, interpersonal relationships or just the way you respond to seemingly innocuous interactions like someone cutting you off on the highway. Might not feel so <laughs> innocuous at the time, but it pisses us off. And sure. these things, and every time we get pissed off, the blood pressure rises a little bit. And, and you know, that happens enough times, it stays elevated and it creates problems. Sure, and, it, and, and it's really a, 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 a mental state that you have to put yourself into where the, the stresses of life, like road rage, if you're gonna get upset, you're the one that's getting upset. The person that's cutting you off is just gonna go home and they, they don't know. Right, they're, 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 they're feeling oblivious good about to, themselves. They exactly, just, they got absolutely. where they have to go quicker. Absolutely. Um, 
the, 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 the focus right now, and especially within um, people that I know within our communities, the younger age mm -hmm. of cardiovascular disease and stroke and heart attack from 30s to 40s to 50s is so much more prevalent. I, I, I guess maybe I feel that way because I know mm -hmm. of so many individuals who are that young who have suffered, you know, uh, strokes, have suffered heart attacks at a very young age, even, even doctors mm -hmm. um, who have lost their lives because of, you know, sudden, sudden heart mm -hmm. attacks. So is that more prevalent right now, or is that, is that, is that a statistic? Um, are, is it because of the uh, huge demand on our attention, because more stresses, uh, the younger generation realizes more stresses than it did before? or is there something else going on? Uh, th there's probably two components to this. The first is that certainly life is a lot more stressful it now is, uh, than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, as I alluded to a couple minutes ago, uh, the constant bombardment of information and the expectation of immediate responses when a text message or email or you could tell them old school uh, hits right. or, or you know, <laughs> but other social media obligations, so to say, people spend hours uh, upon hours on, on Facebook and Twitter and other interactions. I'm still not on Instagram and Twitter. Me neither. I I've never done any out. of that, uh, <laughs> but thank God for both of us, right? right. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's certainly that side of it, and then there's a lot more processed food out there, even though we have a lot more farmer's markets and a lot more awareness of healthful uh, uh, dietary uh, intake, there's a lot more processed food out there. When you have this fast-paced, on-the-go lifestyle, picking up something at McDonald's is easier than spending an hour or two going through the farmer's market, picking out the produce, planning your meal, and cooking it. I, and I'm victim to that as well. But still, you, you bring a real important yeah. point. I mean, with the GMOs, and I mean, if you're cooking a salmon meal, you don't know whether that salmon is healthy or not, or what yeah. it's being fed, especially with our current environment yeah. and, you know, Monsanto and, and, mm -hmm. and the creation of these non-organic, Produce and 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 meats and vegetables. I mean, well, even things that are sold to us, so to say, as as healthy uh, right. fruit juices that are ten percent fruit and right. ninety percent high fructose corn syrup, which we know contributes to early onset atherosclerotic disease. Diet sodas, which help keep weight off, but produce a lot of other toxins in the body. So there's certainly a lot of that side of it going on. And even to say this, there's there's a lot of push to to hide risks. So one of the big things for the American Heart Association right now is looking at vaping and looking at Juul right. and cigarette alternatives. Uh, I passed by a store the other day that said, quit smoking, start using Juul. And so you're convincing a population that uh, smoking is bad, but this other form of getting your nicotine is good. And I know in, in the Arab community, the hookah lounges are everywhere, and, and it seems to be a great idea for a social it's interaction. Cool, it's social, absolutely. But at the end of the day, what you're basically doing is inhaling things that are not good for your body. So there's that side of it, all the risk factors, but there's also a lot more attention in the medical community uh, towards the fact that young people are at risk. So yeah, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you're 30 years old and you show up in the ER and your arm is numb, oh, it's just a pinched nerve, oh, it's nothing, nothing going on. Uh, and now we're realizing strokes are very common uh, in, in younger individuals. You show up with chest pain and you're 30, oh, don't worry about it. But now we're starting to recognize- it's indigestion. Yeah, it's indigestion <laughs> until you have your massive heart attack and die right. and, and we don't ever want that. So you do have a lot more uh, attention being paid to the fact that these things are occurring in young individuals. So it's, it's a combination, I would say, of a greater awareness and attention uh, on the part of individuals and the medical community, but also uh, just this, this growing compendium of risk factors that oftentimes we don't even know are, are there. Well, you have a certain project that you're working on called the Phoenix mm -hmm. Project, and, and that's directly correlated to zip codes, community DNA, mm -hmm. and, and what you're exposed to. So tell us a little bit about that, because that, that really fascinates me, um, yeah. especially in terms of cardiovascular health. Well, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to expand upon Please. this. So Phoenix... Uh, is an initiative from Wayne State University that I'm spearheading, and it's called uh, Phoenix because uh, it's an acronym for the Population Health Outcome and Information Exchange. And at its core, uh, it started out as an effort uh, by our research team to identify just how impactful is high blood pressure on a community. So at a population level, if you decrease blood pressure by one millimeter of mercury, not saying you or I were to drop from 130 to 129, but take five, 10,000 people in, in the neighborhood, right? You're, 
your area and in, in, in where you live or where I live, and that whole community drops by one millimeter of mercury. You decrease incident coronary heart disease or development of coronary heart disease by 10 to 15 percent. You reduce strokes by about the same and heart failure by a little bit more. And so we always wanted to sort of figure out how, how do you measure that? How do you really get a population level number like that? So we started aggregating data, de-identified data from patients in the emergency departments. And by de-identification, I mean we strip out anything that would tell you who that person them. is. And then we aggregate information at the census tract level and the zip code level. Census tracts are, are more like neighborhoods, but a little bit bigger. They're anywhere from two to 8,000 people, and they represent more of a community. Zip codes can cross multiple community boundaries and are obviously much larger. larger. Uh, but what we're trying to do with these things is figure out, first and foremost, are there areas in the region where risk factors like blood pressure are more impactful than others? What, what we're honestly finding is that it's everywhere. We see when we do our, our project, and what we do with the Phoenix is we map it all out. So we, we have a visual representation of this, and we've now mapped out more than 550,000 health encounters. Uh, over 26 months uh, from uh, emergency departments from the Detroit Medical Center and Henry Ford Health System. Respectful pool. Yeah, it's a, it's a large, large number. And what we see when we map this out is that pretty much everywhere in the region has a problem with uncontrolled blood pressure, elevated blood pressure. So rather than just saying, though, that Detroit or Dearborn or any community has a problem with blood pressure, we really wanted to drill down and say, okay, are there areas that are better than others? And are there areas that are worse than others? And if there are those areas, what may be contributing to it beyond just the people who live there? So we started to take the mapping of the blood pressures, which again really started out as an effort to try to figure out how does the pressure load of a community impact it, to say, like you, you just mentioned, what, what's the DNA of the community? We often talk about precision health which is the DNA of a person. What are they most likely to respond to? What are they most likely to be at risk for based on their genome? We're trying to figure out beyond the person, what are people more likely to be at risk for based on community factors, based on the DNA of where they live. So you can think Whether of things- Whether they're next to an incinerator or garbage, uh, uh, yeah, you know, disposal uh, area or-, or Oil refinery. Smokestacks or, or oil refineries. Or is there a high crime? Are they in a food desert, meaning that they don't have uh, options to get healthful food so that when we see high sodium consumption, instead of saying it's the individual's fault for consuming so much sodium, we'd step back and say, where else are they going to what do they have access to? Yeah, what do they have access to? And do they have transportation if there's no access in their immediate community to get something else? Do they have access to health care? Now, health care is not the panacea for health, but it, it uh, is an important component to ensure that people can get the medications they need uh, and get the, the conversation with a, a medical provider uh, to get some information they may not be able to, to ascertain on their own. But what we started doing with, with the map is pull in uh, all of these social determinants that you can get from various different population level surveys and, and data sources. And we're finding some really interesting things. There are communities in the city of Detroit where 60 plus percent of the people live below the poverty level. Employment, uh, sorry, excuse me, unemployment is 30, 45 percent, somewhere in that range. And there is a high reliance on uh, the emergency department for routine care, which because um, they don't have health care. They don't have health care. And not only do they not have health care, they don't know how to interact with the health care system, even if they did. And, and so we, we've looked into this. We've looked at neighborhoods where we saw high ER utilization rates uh, and actually uh, went to the communities and talked to people to say, is this, is this real or is this just uh, something we're seeing that's an anomaly? And they said, no, this is what we do because not only might they not have access to health care, but if the health care is even accessible, is it readily available? Are the clinics open at the times when people who do day labor jobs can get in there? If you work nine to five or 10 to six or whatever it might be and a clinic is only open nine to four and you need the money to pay for food <laughs> you and you have to you know, clothe your kids and do all this kind of stuff, you can't take the day off. And so you do one of two things. You either neglect your health care or you go to the emergency department when you're able to do it. And going to the emergency department for episodic care for these, these risk factors like hypertension and diabetes uh, is really suboptimal because emergency departments aren't equipped or geared to deal with that. Right. And so one of the other things that we're really working on is trying to come up with alternative care pathways when patients do show up in the emergency department. Uh, because emergency physicians like myself uh, are often so busy. We get three, four new patients an hour. It's hard to spend the 15 or 20 minutes that an individual needs to get at that issue that you, you have a day job, you need that job. And so when I refer you to primary care when you leave, you can't go. 
And, and so what can we do around that? How can we, we truly make the care that we provide centered around the patient, what's, what's known these days as patient-centric care versus healthcare system or, or physician-centric care, which is you show up when I have time for you, and <laughs> if you can't do that, that's your problem. And we really need to get away from that mindset. So a lot of this is, is leveraging emergency departments for this purpose and reimagining what uh, ERs do uh, and, and to say this has been my own evolution in, in mindset because I am an emergency doctor. I was trained in uh, acute interventions for things like heart attacks and strokes and cardiac arrest and, and, and polytrauma. But the reality is that in most places that's not what's seen regularly and in urban environments where we have all of these other social determinant issues, the emergency department really serves as a, as a primary care setting. Now, it, it's unfortunate, uh, some of you may recall years ago when George Bush uh, was asked when he was president, uh, why don't we have universal health care? His response was, we do have universal health care, go to the ER. And, <laughs> and really, you know, that is, that's sort of um, emblazoned in the mindset of some people. The health system I work for advertises 29 minutes or less to see an ER physician. And that incentivizes the population to go where it's convenient. We're in a, well, I guess it was 140 character, now it's 280 character world with Twitter where people want quick snippets and they want what they want when they want it and they don't want to wait. And healthcare is not geared up for that world. No, it's definitely not. Within your, within your research, um, you, you talk about Gross Point and Detroit, and and the very small mm -hmm. distance between them, which is variable of ten miles, and the disparities and the difference in that disparity in regards to health care and 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 hypertension and and everything else, and and I through our conversation definitely, um, you know, uh, demographics plays mm -hmm. a huge huge role. But what have you seen um, in regards to Detroit, Gross Point, you know, Dearborn? I mean, what is the correlation there, and how can we look at it uh, to think about preventative mm -hmm. uh, medicine or preventative uh, ways to adhere to to not be a victim of mm -hmm. of hypertension and stress and everything else? And I know, you know, every area has its own challenges, but what do we do, collectively speaking, to be able to to protect ourselves from, from all those risk factors? Yeah, so, so here we are in southeast Michigan, and you described three pockets of populations, and all you need to do is drive down the street from Dearborn through Detroit over to Gross Point, Gross Point. and you'll see very different looking people, you'll see very different looking communities, and you'll see very different aesthetics. And that alone contributes to the concept of community and this idea of a culture of health and, and expectations. In, in Gross Point, it may be very easy to go run along Lakeshore Drive and have a beautiful afternoon run as the sun sets going down. And relaxing. And relax. In Detroit, it's not quite so easy, although there are a lot of recreational opportunities that have been increasing. Uh, the the DeQuinter Cut and the things that they're doing on the waterfront, that's all great. In Dearborn, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a balance in between, uh, not not so much the river, but but uh, you know, a little bit more open space, and and you kind of look at these areas and you say, okay, so you have differences in recreational opportunities, you have differences in in uh, socioeconomic circumstances, you have differences in the genetic makeup of the people who are there, the ethnic makeup of the people who are there. All of that contributes to this, but but one thing that's that uh, I think uh, we can't stand for as a society is that you're mean life expectancy if you're in Detroit, 48201 zip code where uh, my hospital is located, is 69. If you're in Gross Point, it's 83. 82, 83, uh, 82 yeah. 83, depending on, you know, wherever. And why is there a 13 year difference? Well, a lot it's of that- drastic. It is. A lot of that traces to earlier onset of heart disease in Detroit, uh, which then traces back to risk factors like hypertension, which uh, in contrast to what a lot of your viewers or other people may think, it's not a, individual doing or not doing something that necessarily contributes to it. There are factors at the social and societal level that contribute to this. As you mentioned before, if you live near an incinerator, and thank God the incinerator in Detroit is finally closing, but if you live near an incinerator and find particulate matter is spewing into the air 24 hours a day, and you breathe that air in when you're sleeping at nighttime or wherever, 
that is going to contribute to your cardiovascular risk. If you then smoke cigarettes on top of that, because perhaps your cigarette is the only thing you have control of <laughs> in your whole life, reliever. and it's that's your stress reliever, that's there. And, and if you can't exercise because the neighborhoods aren't safe, and if there's uh, high crime rates, and so you're always on this heightened state of alert, the fight or flight response, and then you have your genetic predisposition to this, and all you have are high sodium options for food, you can see the confluence of this would all create multiple different pathways to get at the point where your blood pressure is more elevated, then you don't have access to healthcare and your blood pressure can't get controlled and you don't have the ability to do self-care behaviors that are uh, needed to optimize your blood pressure, all of this plays changing into Changing routines, yeah. changing, changing everything. What advice can you give in layman's terms mm -hmm. to individuals who may not be in the best socioeconomic environment to concentrate on better health habits um, and and how do you change the habits that you have formed through the years and yeah. be cognizant of the fact that these habits are directly correlated to your lifespan basically mm -hmm. so I mean what do you what do you say to those people who do not have access to the best um, foods uh, the best exercise facilities you know just just uh, the, the social uh, things that make us happy in mm -hmm. terms of taking walks in a clean neighborhood, you know, seeing the river, seeing, seeing water, um, you know, something relaxing after work. I mean, people don't live in those neighborhoods. And we had talked earlier, too, yeah. um, about taking walks in very dangerous neighborhoods. I mean, that in itself causes stress as well. Yeah. So how do we address that and how do we, how do we change this, this ever, you know, growing snowball of, of health care disparities in these communities. Yeah, I, I would say, first and foremost, as a society, we have to recognize that everyone's life matters. And there are not people who are more or less worthy of health care, and there are not people who are more or less worthy of living long, healthful lives. And I think that's really important. I do uh, think that the, the mental health aspects of this are important. Uh, yes. yeah. If um, you don't have a job and you can barely make your rent payments and your house is going to get foreclosed, how are you not depressed? How does that not play into Great this? Stress. And, if, and if you're depressed and that you have anxiety about all of the other things that are going on, why would you take your medications? Why would you do anything else beyond that? And so how do you start just with the basics, which are uh, to support people to lead happy, healthy lives? that's a tough one, right? Because all the rhetoric we're hearing in, in the government and, and politics these days and, and uh, Obamacare this and Obamacare that, I, I think people really need to take a step back and understand we're, we're not talking about leeches on society, we're talking about people. Human beings. Human beings and everybody uh, is, it, it's not a blame game. We're all born into a set of circumstances that um, often is not our fault. And I think we're one of the very few countries who do not have a universal health care plan. And that's, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's the discussion. Um, and hopefully, well, you know, there, 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 there will be a, uh, a resolution to that. We'll see. Not, maybe not in the next two years, but we'll see after that. We can all, we can all hope. But uh, I, I think, so, you know, that's, that's one of the basic things that has to be at least considered. And then within that context, uh, people have to uh, be motivated to be healthy. And right now, society really supports a narrative that uh, everybody's going to get an illness, and the only pr way you can manage an illness is to have health care insurance and then go to a doctor and do all these kind of things. I, I think people really need to aspire to be well and understand what that means and takes. But those are tough decisions. It's tough to get up in the morning and work out. <laughs> it's tough to come home uh, at night and not uh, open up the ice cream at 11 o'clock when you're ready for bed. You know, I mean, I know we've all done these things. I do it myself. And yeah, exactly, guilty as charged. And and at some point, you have to kind of ask, what is your why? That's one of the things right. the American it's Heart the Association talks aspect. a lot about. Yeah. What is your why? Why are you going to do this? Why do people show up for a heart walk? Why do people join the board of the American Heart Association? They know somebody who had a stroke. They know somebody who had a heart attack. They don't want to be a heart attack or stroke victim themselves. Uh, so those contribute. But, you know, those are some of the aspects. And then understanding what resources do exist for you if you want to pursue this. So uh, you may not be able to afford fresh produce all the time, but there are programs from 
uh, organizations like the Fair Food Network right here at home uh, in the Metro Detroit area that will do a program called Double Up Food Bucks. And if you're going to go buy produce from Eastern Market, they'll give you twice the money uh, to buy that produce. And understanding where you can go. So people it's may not know. Yeah. Yourself, yeah, it's about absolutely. educating yourself. It's about uh, community organizations providing outlets so that people can get that education and get the support. But it's also about um, knowing what you don't know. So you might be fearful of going grocery shopping because you don't know what to buy <laughs> uh, or you don't know what to do with it once you buy it. And so not being afraid to ask uh, for cooking and not, uh, you know, cooking help or lessons and that type of thing. Uh, and not um, necessarily looking for the cheapest option and understanding that sometimes uh, um, the, the cheaper options are not going to be the most healthy options. And again, not saying that everyone can afford anything they want, but it shouldn't be that um, people have to buy high fructose corn syrup based products or high sodium products or high fat products uh, because of the cheaper alternatives. There, there needs to be something else done. There has that. to be a responsibility, some, some, some accountability of what is on the market for people to buy uh, as well. Absolutely. Now, your research is really vital um, in regards to our communities and our state and, and, and nationally as well. So we thank you for what you're doing. Um, but it's really about healthy lives exercising and, and our mental health too is really important for that for that encouragement to, to lead yeah. healthy lives. So. I think so and, and at the end of the day um, the most important thing is to arm community members who we're all trying to advocate for and help with the information they need to be self-deterministic. We need to be able to say to a community here's the information what do you think the solution is. It's very difficult for me as a white researcher at Wayne State University to go into a predominantly black community and tell people this is what you need to do this is the answer for you what the hell do I know about that I know what the literature can tell me but I can't tell people what their circumstances are and what they right. can achieve. You can't live in that person's Never. environment and uh, well absolutely but I want to thank you very very much Dr. Phil Levy for for joining us on the forum today and for all your expertise and and what you do out there too create healthy communities and, and that's uh, that's what it's about and we hope too that our policymakers listen and uh, and and apply some some health care uh, provisions that can help uh, individuals and communities to live and uh, and and be healthy and we want to thank you all uh, for joining us on the forum where your voice counts stay healthy out there take the information you learned today apply it to your own life it's healthy living exercise good food, and a happy mental state. Enjoy, have a good day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.